Happy Friday. Welcome back. I'm telling you, it doesn't get better than Fridays and days all at once. It may be, what's the temperature outside? 31 degrees Fahrenheit, real close to zero Celsius on the negative side of zero. And yet, this class keeps us all warm. Maybe not. Maybe <laughs> metaphorically. Okay, let's get going. Um, announcements today. Got a homework three. It's due a long time from now still. So don't even think about it. They're just putting it out there if you wanted to. You could do part, the first part of it. I haven't talked about the second part yet and the third part yet. Yeah, that desk right there is cursed. Would you mind moving? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> For whatever reason, that desk will send us all in a tailspin. Uh, thank you. Thank you for moving. Um, project meetings. I've met with many of you. If you haven't yet done so, please either book a time or come to my office hours. I know I've got a couple more next week, so hopefully we'll get that taken care of. And today we're ending class early at 1.20, so I can go and enjoy a Friday afternoon of administration. Okay. Yeah. You all know... Uh, University duties, what professors have to do with their time. Have you ever heard this before? We are, we're told how much time we're supposed to spend on different sections of our job. Have you heard that? So for instance, a standard appointment is 40% teaching, which equates at this university to two courses per semester. 40% uh, then spent on research, and then 20% of your time spent on service. And we literally get talked, that is put in a document that describes our effort allocation. Uh, and then, if you're a center director or something like that, you might have time spent for uh, administration. So I don't have the administrative time, and my teaching is 20%, which is why I teach one class a semester and then had grant buyouts for the other semester. But um, things like this eat into, I think, the core mission of the university. So I'm a big proponent of less is more when it comes to administrative work. But that, I feel like I'm the only one who feels that way. So anyway. Too much information. Where do you re what do you remember about from Wednesday? At least it was Wednesday this time. You remember where we left off at least? We were making statistics out of our IRT models. I find these to be really fun, by the way. Do you remember that? I call them uh, auxiliary um. statistics. So let me get down there. There we go. Last time we talked about the test characteristic curve for any given value of theta. You remember in our example, we don't have people at every value of theta, but we, we may still want to create a test characteristic curve on the off chance we ever observe somebody at that value of theta. And this is what we did. We had to import a, a vector of thetas into stand. Did I show you that code? I don't actually think I th showed you that code. Oh, I did, did I? That's good. Yeah, there it is, theta vowels. I don't think I actually showed the, uh, the stand code. Oh, sorry about people online. I knew I forgot something. I'm over here bragging that I, I got everything taken care of. Let's go back. So we're in auxiliary statistics starting on slide 59. Double check a couple things here, make sure I'm up and running. There we go. Okay. And, um, one thing I wanted to note with this is the following. If we import a set of thetas, we have to talk about that in the data section in Stan, right? So I had in my uh, slides, I had noted here that we created a sequence of theta values from negative three to three in every 0.01 interval. It's a pretty long set of values. But we have to actually import that into Stan and it helps to tell Stan how many thetas there are in that. So that's what this last section of syntax right here does. Okay. And then in the generated quantity section, now this generated quantity actually I have the test characteristic curve, something for item information and something for test information all right here as well. But you'll see in the generated quantities, I actually loop over all of the thetas right here. So every value of theta right here 
I have a test characteristic curve value that's set for it. And it turns out, if we flip over to what the test characteristic curve definition is, you see this term inside the sum, e over 1 plus e, e to something over 1 plus e to something. Remember the name of that was the inverse logit function? Turns out Stan actually has a built-in function called INV logit. So whenever you want to calculate, go from the model scale, which is in logits, to the data scale, which is in probabilities, you stick the thing you want into the function and it out comes a probability. So what this is calculating is for any given theta value we give it, we give it the model based probability of answering a specific item correctly with that code right there. And the cool thing about that is we don't have to actually observe the theta, we can, this is the theta value that we're conditioning on that we stuck into Stan with that list of thetas we wanted to calculate it for. And then, you know with generated quantities, the values of A and B, the other parameters in our model, are going to be their current value at that iteration of the Markov chain. Right? So it's going to be calculating for every iteration of the Markov chain a test characteristic curve for all the thetas we want it to give it to with that curve's current values of the chain. So what this makes me want to think about is think of how much data, like if you remember statistics, where you're like, oh, I'm gonna calculate a test characteristic curve. I have one A, I have one B, a two PL, here's my range of thetas. You do that once for every A and B. For the, for the MCMC to get a curve that looks like this, we end up having to do that for every single chain. But there's value in this, right? The nice thing about this is that we get to ter determine what an expected score would be for somebody with a given value of theta, which is kind of cool, right? Uh, I will say that this expected score does not in include, though, the current theta value of the um, of the chain, right? We've conditioned it on a fixed value of theta. So if we were to actually do this with the current theta values, you would expect that width around where the black lines are to be even wider because each person's theta is going to vary a lot too, right? So any thoughts on that? Bayes needs lots of disk space. <laughs> Takes a lot, right? Are you overwhelmed? It's okay, you can be overwhelmed. Are you underwhelmed? Yeah. yeah so just to be sure, what you're saying is that there we are using the uh, parameters in the logic scale, but with the in underscore logic function, we are transforming those logic parameters into something different. That's right, okay. a probability, probability okay. which is the data scale. So remember the test characteristic curve is the sum of the expected probability for each item, or another way of putting it, for a given value of theta, the test characteristic curve gives you the expected score on the assessment. The score being the sum of the expected value for each item response. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. But, but because we're talking about expected values, that's data scale, right? This, the, the metric, right? So the metric of the test characteristic curve, as you'll see here, the range of y goes between 0 and 10, which is the data itself. We had 10 items on this survey. Okay? Yeah. All right. Does that all sound familiar to you? Okay. When we talked about item information, I want to underscore the part. This item information is related to your MAP estimate of theta. Right? It is specific to your MAP estimate of theta. It's not specific to the posterior distribution where we get the standard deviation that we get in the chain. And the re reason for that is the calculation of this involves a derivative. What it's talking about is the curvature of the posterior, uh, posterior distribution at a given value of theta. And that describes how much variation there is. But that's at a given value that's a maximum itself. Or in our case, whenever you hear maximum in Bayes, you translate that to mode, right? Modal posterior function. So we could, but we could calculate this too. Calculating it here. You can see the item information function on the left in my syntax. That is the um, 
this formula, you can see this formula has, you know, there's a, other ways of putting it, but sometimes you see this with the letter P of theta and the letter Q of theta sometimes in the IRT books, if, you, if you're familiar with those. That's just, again, a probability. That's an inverse logit, and here is your inverse logit. You calculate it. But the cool thing about this is we also can quantify the uncertainty in the information function for each item. So what am I talking about here, right? Here's your item information function. The EAP estimates the red dashed line. So if you were just doing this with the um, posterior mean of your A and B parameter for item one, that red line would tell you where the maximum amount of information is, which would be for a theta that's somewhere around you know, 1.5 or so. So we know already this item is a very low endorsement item, right? People, it's actually more endorsed than any other item in our sample, but where the, the peak of the information function still happens to be is where in a two parameter model where the B parameter is. So that's, that peak is still, the EAP peak is at the EAP value of B, the B parameter. Right? But there's variation in that. And I mentioned this variation because, uh, well, what do we use item information for? Where do you use item information? What's that? Reliability. Reliability. Yes. Let's think of it another way. Where, where else do we use it? Or um, think of test construction methods. What do we use this for to construct tests? We can come up with a test information function, which talks about how reliable or how, um, how much information there is at a given value of theta across the entire assessment. So we talk about, a lot of talk about this. Sometimes we use it to describe how reliable our estimates are or how much the, 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 conditional, or the conditional standard error of measurement happens to be. But oftentimes we use this in test construction to try to design an assessment that has a certain amount of, a range of, uh, pardon me, a, a certain specification of what a target function might be. Have you ever heard that before, a target test information function? So why I'm saying that is you can imagine what the target information function might be. This item's contribution of that target information function is usually the red line, but if we wanted to build it in a way that represented um, the variability in our assessment because we may not have a large sample to work with, we've got to consider the black lines, right? So that black line, the, the posterior draws themselves, are showing how much variation there is in what we believe the, this item contributes. So I think that's an interesting way of looking at it. Where that might be useful, um, the other part where this is useful, if you're using a maximum information uh, criterion to select items in a computerized adaptive assessment, right? So a computerized adaptive assessment where each item is selected based on the person's current value of the lead trade, this item, where do you pick the maximum for it? Right? What, where would it tell you that information? Right? Would it be right here? Or actually, for a given value of theta, where would the maximum fall? Right? So I mentioned this because if you're trying to build a computerized adaptive assessment and you don't have large scale data, I think this is handy. This will help you sort of come up with a better picture of how much information an item might give. Because it doesn't just give you the point estimate of information, it also gives you a range of values where it might fall within for a given value of theta. I think that's cool. Any thoughts on that? How many of you like computerized adaptive assessments? I hear we have a class on that next semester. Everybody's interested. All right. Let's talk about the test information function. It's typically thought of in non-Bayesian sense as the sum of the information function for each item across the assessment. But because we're in Bayes land, bless you, in Bayes land, can I call it Bayes land? It's like Disneyland, <laughs> Bayes land. I like that, Bayes land, I'll call it. This is Bayes land. All right, in Bayes land, sorry, that's a terrible joke. I'm a dad, I get it. Middle-aged man, all right. Okay, those are like, if those are my worst quantity, qualities, actually they're probably not, but I'd like to think they are, so anyway. 
In Bayes land, the posterior distribution of theta includes a prior. The prior distribution that we set has a specific mean and standard deviation, right? So when we look at calculating the information function for the test, remember that's the information function for theta across all the items. And the core of that is the likelihood function for theta itself. Do you remember the likelihood function for theta? Right? In fact, I'm going to grab it real quick because I want to go back to it. Right here. All right, this is the likelihood of theta conditional on about uh, conditional, I'm sorry, the likelihood of the data. But the posterior distribution is also proportional to the likelihood of the prior. All right? So when we're looking at test information, we're looking at the entire, what the prior is proportional to. And because of that, we have to think about this extra term. So how do we get that extra term in the prior? Well, to calculate the test information function, we took that, enti that entire product across all the items. We took a log, because we can show that the peak of the test information and the peak of the log are the same, right? So we, we took a log to make things work with, so that each item is separate. Well, that also means that the prior is then separate. So we just look at the prior distribution function by itself, and we apply the same derivative to it, right? We, we differentiate the PDF of theta, the prior distribution of theta, twice with respect to theta itself. Right? So if you think about the PDF of theta, what is it when it's normal? There is 1 over the square root of 2 pi sigma times e to the, you know, right? Take the log of that thing, we lose the normalizing constant, 1 over the square root of 2 pi, because there's no theta in it. When we take the log of e, we lose the exponent. We're just left with the term in the exponent. When we set the mean to 0, that means the numerator of the exponent just becomes theta. When we set the standard deviation to 1, the denominator becomes uh, 2. And sure enough, that whole thing is raised to the power of 2. Actually, it's negative 1 times that raised to the power of 2. Twice differentiate that with respect to theta, and we get a negative 1. That's where that shows up. If you don't have a var if you have a different variance here, this will be a different quantity. And actually, if you have a different mean, uh, doing the math in my head here. No, the mean itself will not affect it, because the mean will, will go away when you differentiate the numerator there. Anyway, calculus, fun things, right? OK, I mentioned that. It's not, I guess the bigger picture is this. If you're working in IRT world, maybe you get a job when you're out in a testing company, or you're doing research with IRT, and you're using Bayes, when you calculate these functions, you have to remember the contribution of the prior as well. OK? OK. Here are spaghetti plots. Spaghetti plots. And actually, technically speaking, I, I'm wrong about that. I should, have, I should have contributed the prior to item information, and I didn't. Ooh, ooh. Bad. So this is not entirely item information. But anyway, see, I, I told you. This is where I'm telling you this. I've made these mistakes, right? When you read the IRT textbooks, they're written usually in frequentist language. When you read the Bayesian IRT textbooks, they seldom go into the details like IRT textbooks. They sort of gloss over it, particularly with the prior. So when you're working in this world and you're using Bayes, be ready to think about the prior, the influence of the prior itself, because it will need to be addressed in your, um, in your calculations in the work that you do, if you do it. Okay? Put a little asterisk in your mind and say, so I can't just look up what the formula is in a normal book. You have to find a, a good one. Okay, test information, spaghetti plots. What is test information? Remember, the reciprocal of test information is the variance. One of the square root of that is the standard error we talked about, right? So the higher the test information, the more um, reliability effectively we have, right? Here, our test information is a peak right around, I don't know, a little over one and a half. We expect that. This is a very, uh, an assessment that very few people say yes to any of the items, right? It takes a high amount of theta for someone to say yes, so that means the location or the difficulty items will be up here. And that's where most of our information is concentrated. 
The other note of this is look at the variation in test information, right? It goes all over this place. Yeah. What what is a good scale for the information? Because here we can see the minimum is zero, but some values go up to five thousand. Yeah. Information is going to be on a weird scale. Um, the, the way that I look at information is if you, if you try to relate it to what rely, the classical reliability formula, right, which is variance of true score over variance of true score plus variance of error. Right? The variance of true score we set with our priors. Right? It's the, vari the true score is theta, so the variance of that is 1 that we set it. The variance of error, at least one in this example, we have the sigma squared theta. The variance of error is given over, uh, given by one over the value here, right? So if you go one over um, one plus whatever that other term is, right? Then that other term is one over this. And so what would be a good result for it? Well, it's this thing. What's the reliability? I, I always go back to the reliability metric in the social sciences, at least where I grew up learning in school. It was 0.8, sounds like a good reliability. Now remember, 0.8 is not going to be constant across the scale. And that, that roughly equi is equivalent to a 4 when your posterior variance of theta is 1. So if you do 1 over 1 plus 1 over 4, that's what you end up getting. Right? It's sort of an odd, odd distinction, but that's how it works. Does that make sense? A little bit? I think it's 1 over 4. Yeah. Sure. 1 over 4. <laughs> yeah, it is. One. So yeah, it'd be 4. Number 4. That's where about 0.8 reliability for a given theta is. Now, not everybody agrees on that reliability formula, and not everybody agrees with that, but that's the standard I use. Okay? So when you see 5,000 here, First of all, that's an extreme value. It's probably at one of the um, one of the values of A or Bs that are really extreme in our sample, our posterior sample. So this is where you start to see those values. But you do see what we're saying here is what, while we believe the signal in our data is this red line, you can tell we have a lot of variation somewhere between a little under one to about two and a half values of theta. So we have a lot of wiggle into where we think the, the information is concentrated for what we do. Interesting? You like this? Anyway. Questions? Anybody going to use this? It's a terrible ask, question to ask. I was in a stat class. It's like my last stat class from a master's in statistics. And I remember the, like, the last half of it. It's like after spring break. I'm like, I am never going to use some of the stuff that we're talking about. Something about admissibility, something about blah, blah, blah. Just, we're so far removed from data or anything that is numbers. It's all, you know, just done. Six months later, working on my PhD. Need to use it. <laughs> so, so when I ask you, you're going to use this, my guess is your answer is no. But if you are in a spot where you're using Bayesian methods and doing something like item response theory, the traditional methods of IRT you have to sort of adapt to fit into the Bayes space. That's all. OK? Any questions? Are you not just thrilled about, never mind, that's not thrilling. Not thrilling either. OK, you want to talk about how to do other IRT models? Up to this point, we've just done the 2PL, or the slope-intercept version of it, right? The other IRT models. Are, are certainly possible. However, there's one, one catch. The Bernoulli logit function, remember what it does. It takes the term inside its parentheses, believes it's a logit, so it converts it to a probability using the inverse logit function, and then sticks it immediately in the Bernoulli distribution probability spot that we saw before, right? Remember that, the, how that chains together. That only applies pretty much for the one or two parameter models that we have. If you start to get to any type of probability that's outside of um, a logit, outside of the logit set, any parameter that's literally on the data metric, like the C parameter, the guess, pseudo-guessing parameter, 
this isn't going to work. So instead, we now just use the Bernoulli distribution. Right? The Bernoulli distribution expects a probability to be submitted for it. So we can take the inverse logit function and give that probability. Right? So what's happening is Bernoulli, the Bernoulli logit was effectively doing two functions. It was doing Bernoulli and then inverse logit. We just stopped it from doing that when we switched to Bernoulli and we used this inverse logit here. Bernoulli logit is a really convenient function, particularly if you're not doing latent variable models or weird latent variable models like the three parameter model. I say it's weird, but it's a mixture of data scale and model scale. So if you're in a generalized modeling framework, if you're doing logistic regression or any generalized linear model or multi-level model, Bernoulli logit is usually what you go to. So I wanted to show you that. But if you're not, if you're using a probit model, if you're using one of those weird link functions I had shown you before, if you're using a parameterization that has a probability in it, you've got to work with the probabilities themselves. So that's where inverse logic comes in. Cool? Let's talk about the one parameter model. I'm calling this one PL model. Sometimes this is called the Roche model. But depending on who you are, where you were trained and what software you use, people sometimes re reserve Roche for very specific terms. So for instance, uh, there's a program called WinSteps. How many of you have used that before? Maybe. It fixes the difficulty to have a, a given mean and estimates theta freely. Right? So depending on how you do things, that may or may not work out. The other thing I will note is usually in the one parameter model, the variance of theta is estimated too. I'm holding off on that now because I'm going to have a lecture on weirder priors. Because in a frequentist sense, in the one parameter model, we have a constraint such that all the slopes, the A parameters, discriminations, are equal to one, right? Sometimes you see it phrased where they're equal to a common A, a common A parameter. But here, the, um, the difference, I, I'm just going to leave this as a one here. So depending on who you talk to, this may or may not be an official Roche model, but I'm not. How many of you know about Roche? Here at Iowa, we don't teach you a lot of Rosh. There's a cult. It's like a cult. I, I gotta say, I gotta be careful. I might just bleep this out of the YouTube video because they come hunt for me. Right? It's like, like the Illuminati of psychometrics or something. Right? They're they're gonna come after me. But have you have you? Uh, if you give me just a moment. They have a great website called Rosh.org. The style of the 1990s kind of looks like Yahoo's first page, but um, anyway, there's they have a great amount of research and theory in Rosh. Rosh is really popular in many places. Rosh is very simple to work with. My biggest issue with Rosh is my biggest issue with anything is you got to make sure the model fits the data, and they do that. They try that. In fact, you could even calculate. Your model fit statistics in Bayes, in a Bayes sense too. When you hear Rosh, you typically see model fit statistics, something called in-fit and out-fit. Don't have time to cover those in this class, but you could do that in generated quantities as well too. Okay, so let's see how this works. It's theta minus B in the inverse logit. All right, got 20 minutes left. I'm just gonna flip through these. Next, the three pre all model. This one's a little bit more complicated. Here, we've got a C parameter. Its range, it, it's basically a probability. The C parameter represents what we call a lower asymptote. If we look at the item characteristic curve, it's where the, the curve you know, asymptotes to as theta goes to negative infinity. Now that value is typically zero in a two parameter model. But when we put the, prob the probability out here, the C, we know that as theta goes to negative infinity, this probability here goes to zero. That's where the asymptote, that thing in there is the two parameter models, right? So when this goes to zero, it takes with it the term on the outside. So we're left with this lower bound parameter here as its lower asymptote, right? So it's a probability, right? 
So what you end up having to specify is the C parameter for the item right here in the model, plus one times C, times the result of inverse logit. Right, so you can take, remember, the thing in pink here is a probability. Once you get stand to calculate it, you can multiply it and add to it like any other number. So you can do it all within the context of the Bernoulli function, which still keeps Bernoulli evaluated when you take this entire term here, the term right there goes between 0 and 1, so therefore we're fine. I should say the upper asymptote, just to define this, the upper asymptote of the two parameter is 1. So 1 times 1 minus c plus c gives us an upper asymptote of 1. So the range is still between 0 and 1. But that brings up a question. What do we use for a prior distribution for c? Yes. Uh, beta, because the parameter goes from one to, uh, two to one. I the beta distribution. Beta does go between zero and one. I called it a simple prior for C. So have I talked about beta in this class much? I don't think I have. Way back when, did I? At the beginning. In the very beginning. The probability, right, yeah. So beta, when beta, you, you, beta has two parameters to it, an alpha and a, or an A and a B, or however you want to call it. When those parameters are equal to 1, beta is flat. It's uniform. So this is an uninformative prior. How many of you have heard of a program named Bilog? How many of you have used Bilog? It's like the 1980s style IRT. Actually, it's probably ran IRT for a lot of what we did for 25, 30 years, which is incredible. Right? And its default for a C parameter was to pick uh, these two values of the hyperparameters so that the median or the mode, excuse me, the mode of the beta distribution was equal to what a, a guess would be on an item. So these, this, these are not um, ability items, right? These are, these are endorsement items, yes or no. But if you had a multiple choice question and you wanted the C parameter on it, if you had four distractors, right, just without any knowledge, guessing would be 0.25. So it, it would set the values to know how many uh, distractors. You could also overwrite it a little bit. I found for a lot of what I do, even with small amounts of data, finding a beta 1-1 one, one works just fine. Like a uniform prior on it works just fine. Um, people have talked about the 3PL. Negatively, nobody really understands. It's not exactly a guessing parameter. Um, that's why we call it sometimes a pseudo-guessing parameter. But this tends to work out pretty well, and I was going to show you some results. So here, in my two gigabyte file, you can see the model does converge. The R hats are 1.07, so things are a little bit higher than normal. Remember, with the two parameter model, we saw a few, we rarely saw um, parameters that had values bigger than 1.01. 1.07 is sort of on the edge of what I'd say is converged enough. Um, but here, if you look at the parameters, these are each of our C parameters. Here's one that has a 1.05, it's item 10. And what you'll look, what, what happens when one of the item parameters is not behaving well? We can say that, right? When it doesn't converge, it's not behaving. Sorry dealing with children, childhood behavior issues as a parent. That's what I think about. Anyway, <laughs> now you, you little C parameter, be nice, or I'll have to put a tighter prior on, or something like that. Anyway, but you can see the other parameters in item 10 are also a little bit less converged. Um, I can plot them if you'd like. Let's actually just take a look real quick. done this ahead of time. I always want to talk convergence before I start interpreting results. So that's why this is showing up here. Oops, unexpected extra parenthesis. Don't have a base plot loaded? I do.
There it is. I haven't loaded it. Do that then. Cannot find. Oh, I need an A there. There we go. All right, so here's our densities for it. And if I want to do MCMC trace real quick. We see this. There we go. All over the place, right? Things are kind of weird. This would be a candidate where I'd want to put a, a bit more of a prior. Take a look at this right here. Uh, the C parameter is on chain four is, I'm going to use my mouse, right here. The C parameter in the beginning is you know, 0.02, then it hops up to 0.07, then it hops back down here. It's sort of a regime flip. Sometimes when you get a parameter that's one spot, and all of a sudden it jumps up to another spot, and it jumps down another, what my head is thinking is that might be a multiple mode issue. It turns out that the three parameter model with the priors we specified or in a frequentist sense is not guaranteed to have a unified, uh, a single peak to it, right? And it's not just the negative A times, the, uh, negative A times negative theta, like we saw the two modes in theta, there's additional modes that may be present, may be present. If, for those of you who care about this type of stuff or are interested in methods, it's because the C parameter takes us away from this being what's called an exponential family model. So it moves us out of something we can easily define. And the exponential family models and their likelihood functions, the model data likelihoods, not the prior or the posterior, uh, are shown to be single peaked. So when you estimate exponential families, you're fine. When you don't, you get into trouble. Any questions on this so far? You want to talk about the C parameter a little bit? What's C mean? This is the probability that someone with an, uh, the lower bound of the probability, right? And these items, it's really hard to talk about C because normally we call this a guessing parameter. Is somebody going to guess whether they believe in a conspiracy? No. Does that mean we should use the C parameter? I think we still can. The way I look at the C parameter, my impression of it is it is a hedge against model misfit, right? This is telling you that the model is not entirely, when the lower asymptote is off of zero, for whatever reason, it's telling you the model is not entirely fitting the way you expect it to. Now, what that really means, I don't know, but that is what happens with it. Yeah. What's this scale of known parameters now with the new Bernoulli? With this, so all of these, because they show up inside the inverse logit, those are all logits. Okay. But the C parameters are all probabilities. Great. All right, anybody seen the four parameter model? Yeah. I was gonna can you just remind me what the outcome is that we're modeling? We are modeling. For the items? Oh, there's a spider on my screen. Um, we are modeling whether or not someone agreed with a statement. So I took the, of those, those those 10 weird conspiracy items, right? So I took values of four or five and those become one. So I'm making the point that, remember the model doesn't care if you have items that where people can easily guess or not. The model is doing the best it can mathematically to figure out the parameter estimates. So just because you don't have multiple choice doesn't mean you can't use a C parameter. It just means Actually, when you include the C parameter, do you know what happens to theta? Or item information, do you remember that? Anybody talk about that? So item information with a C parameter, actually without the C parameter, item information, the peak information is located where? At the item difficulty of an item. But with the C parameter, the item information moves above the difficulty, right? Basically, you've taken that that loads it and compressed it because the C parameter is now the lower asymptote, so it moves it. So the location of maximum information shifts. Second, typically your estimates of theta also shift. You end up, if the C parameters are not zero, posterior standard deviations of theta will be larger. Would you like me to try to compare and contrast to C? I would love it. Let's see if that works. All right, this takes a little bit of effort, but I can do it. Uh, 
three, I say, theta three PL equals that. Uh, and then we'll do theta two PL equals, now I gotta find my two PL model. 2PL discrimination difficulty. Let's do that. And here, that. So let's do this plot. Okay, the 3PL dollar sign mean theta. 2PL dollar sign mean, and let's do this. X equals three, and Y equals two. So here is a plot of those thetas, and you'll see it's not a linear plot, right? So what's happening, right? Thetas of zero for the three parameter are more like thetas that are somewhere between 0.5 and one for the two parameter, right? It shifts the mean of theta. It still has a floor for both, but that floor occurs in different places, right? In fact, you'll see that uh, the, the lower bound of theta here is much smaller, whereas the upper bound is right about the same. So once you get further away from where the lower bound is, it starts to be a lot more consistent. And that's because the lower bound is this asymptote, right? It's moving where that probability is, and it's changing the amount of information theta has to use for lower values of theta. Should we see the standard deviation now? That's the thing that is key to me. So here's the theta standard deviation for the three, and here's for the two. So a standard deviation of 0.5-ish, or a little bit above 0.5 for the three. Let me use my cursor. This dot right here is a little bit above 0.5 for the three, but for, point, for the two, it is like 0.25, right? And so what you end up seeing here, if I were to draw a line, um, is that generally speaking, the mean, the, the standard deviation, the posterior standard deviation of theta is larger in the three parameter than the two parameter, right? And so this is my argument for the three parameter model. It's not, based on guessing, it's based on model fit, right? If the three parameter model fits the data better, you should use it. Like the guessing parameter or pseudo guessing or whatever, people will argue a lot about what that means. To me, it says the two parameter doesn't fit and it's being picked up by this other term. So I call it a hedge against model fit, right? It's a kind of a weird way of talking about it. And actually, uh, the, the, it, my predecessor in my job, Bob Brennan and I, the Bob Brennan, who honestly I was a little bit intimidated to talk to the first time I talked to him in my life, but um, he and I got in a little bit, not an argument, a conceptual argument about 3PL. He doesn't like the 3PL. I get it. Not a lot of people do. But I'm talking about if you're in the business of selling thetas, you want to be accurate with how much information you have about it, right? So if you say I'm a two parameter model shop for theta, or I'm a one parameter model shop, but you say your standard error is smaller, if the model doesn't fit better, you should be going with a model that fits better because the standard error will be a little bit more accurate. So I, what I think about it is, this is, if you're trying to give people theta or do something with theta, it behooves you to get the model right because you'll get the standard deviation right. And we know the standard deviation talks about reliability. So all that's kind of key, that's the way I look at it. How are we doing? Is this too much theta? That's what we do, all theta all the time. Um, anybody ever heard of a four parameter beta, four, four parameter IRT model before? There's an upper asymptote. I won't go into it much, but I'll just say where that one is, that's the upper asymptote. Some people put a D parameter. Again, Rod McDonald, someone I worked with, I like to put a D parameter there, and it's much for the same reason. What's the upper asymptote mean? I don't know, but it's a hedge against model fit, right? So if you're fitting one parameter model or one dimensional model, and all your models fit well, 
and this helps with it, the model fit in some ways, but gives you a little bit different estimate of each person's, person's score. Have I IRT'd us to death now? Everybody looks like done. Are you done? We're almost done with class. I don't discount the model fit angle of like, you should have a model that fits your data. And like, I still think there should be a conceptual reason why you include. Conceptual reasons are why science fails. <laughs> I wouldn't I would um, say that. That's not necessarily the case. So, like, I understand the guessing parameter in like, like a knowledge sense, right? Like, if a yeah. question is well, asked. It's only because you're saying the word knowledge. guessing. If you say a lower asymptote, you remove yourself from that. But I'm, I'm having trouble making the flip to what a lower asymptote is when you're asking about subjective questions like these. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Right. It basically means uh, no matter how low the, it's sort of the lower, lowest chance someone would have endorsed into the item, period. Like it's like the end. Right? I have a hard time thinking about what it means, but it's like saying here, like item, Item three, we know people with very low theta still have a four or five percent chance of answering the item correct. There's still a leftover chance of it. And that's basically, if you think about it, compared to the two parameter model, the two parameter model says, no, 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 the lower theta goes, the smaller that probably gets. So this is telling you how far off from the two parameter you really are. I look at this. If you look at it in that context of model comparison. Great, thank you. Likewise, I have never been able to describe why an upper asymptote should exist. Right? What the heck? Somebody who's really, really high on theta still has a chance they wouldn't endorse an item. What's that mean? Right? Usually that means there's something multidimensional going on that you didn't model or something along those lines. But again, I think to me that's saying how, how badly does your assumption of an upper asymptote of one fit the data or not? So that's, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah? Should we use relative relative We should. We should. And I haven't shown you those yet. They get a little more complicated with this, these models, but I'll, I'll do that after Thanksgiving. Why do something today that you can put off till tomorrow? By the way, that's the discussion at my house these days with my son. All right, spare you the details, we've got a couple minutes left. So that's all the, lo we just got all crazy with the logits, but if you come up with a five parameter model, you know how to do it now. You just have to use the Bernoulli function and put the values in there, right? Cool. Um, Let's talk about a different link function. How about the normal ogive? Because who doesn't, a good, doesn't love a good normal ogive? Right? Um, if you were in a shop that was doing that, again, you'd use the Bernoulli function. Here, I'll just do it this way. The normal ogive takes the term that's continuous and treats it like a z-score, and it figures out the cumulative probability of that z-score from a standard normal distribution. That's what this phi function do, does. And to do it, sure enough, Stan has a function named phi, which converts it. So you use phi instead. Why would you pick normal ogive? I don't know. It's the, uh, once you go back to the model scale, excuse me, the data scale, the models fit approximately the same. Comparing and contrasting on the model scale what theta is versus what the A's and B's are, there's a scaling constant or a little bit of approximation that you'll have to do to figure that out. But otherwise, if you wanted that, you do that. Alternatively, remember those link functions I started the class this lecture with? Log log, complementary log log, all that stuff? You'd code that in here too. Like you could just do log of log, you know, log of log or whatever it is the link function is. Just put that in the Bernoulli and so long as that what you put inside Bernoulli returns a value between 0 and 1 it works. Cool? Alright. Any questions? Any questions online? I see a question. Jonathan. I, yeah, sorry I didn't see your question before. Go for it. No, it's okay. It was about syntax so I didn't want to interrupt your modeling thoughts. No problem. Um, <laughs> so for the vectors being called in the syntax, I expected to see double brackets. Is single brackets just by virtue of Stan? So great question. Um, here, the single brackets are because I called Y an array. And so when you use an array, you can talk about a single bracket with respect to 
the outer terms, in this case the rows, and it implies the rest. So like in R, this would be similar to saying item, comma, and a blank spot, implying all the rows, or in this case, the other, the second index uh, columns. Does that make sense? Yeah, and then, so when you're calling for the A, B, and C parameters in the other line of code you were on, I didn't catch the row number, but you had brackets calling to A and B and C. That's right, because if you think about it, theta itself has a uh, number of observations. So it's, it has the number, same number, it's a vector that has, you know, 177 observations in it. Um, so that means mm -hmm. Y itself has to match theta. The, the result in here has to be 177 observations. But for each item, there's only one C and only one B and only one A. So to make that oh. work, we have this, this matches the same size here, but all these other terms turn out to be just scalars, just single numbers, and that's why we have to put the bracket there to, to offset them, but that's a great question. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Thank you for asking. Did I see another question? Yeah, sir. I have also have a question related to syntax. Yeah. So um, I see in the uh, stand menu, they have another way to code, uh, code the likelihood function. They just use uh, log likelihood as a as an outcome. So this, this is a exchangeable with just use y and versus using log likelihood yeah. in IRT, yeah. right? You could form your own likelihood function. I'm using Stan's built-in function because I expect it to be faster. The other thing okay. that Stan's function, if you look at Stan's manual, you will see they loop over items and people for their IRT section. That is not vectorized. So the other part of Stan's manual talks about how fast you get, you get faster code mm -hmm. when you vectorize. When I give it mm -hmm. just Y and I don't loop over each observation, it will run faster, okay. at least it should. So that's that's my okay. rationale for why I, I stick with the built-in functions as much as possible. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, there is a considerable amount of improvement and speed in doing it with vectorized with built-in functions. Yes? Pardon me? This, uh, the scale of the new version of the model. Oh, the, the, this one right here. Yeah, this is Z-score. Yeah, so um, like thinking of Z-scores. I mean, technically we have to call them probits, but yeah, they're on the, the range itself uh, is on standardized normal range. So mean zero, standard deviation one. But the output will be in Z-scores? No, they'll be, they'll be in Z-scores. Okay. So if I were to look at the results here, these results right here, the A and B, are effectively on the z-score metric. Okay. Okay. And theta is too. So. Okay, other questions? Thank you for your time. Have a great weekend. I don't have lecture yet for next week, but I'm going to have two exciting lectures that are convinced. One is that on multi, uh, you know, um, excuse me, polytomous or multi-category items, and then we're going to do multidimensional models. Just like that. All right, have a great weekend. Thank you, everybody. See you later online. Thanks for being here.